morning, everybody. How are we doing today? <laughs> a little bit more awake, I see, right? Um, I'm super excited to be here. I was actually really worried I wasn't going to make it. I woke up this morning and I was running a little short-handed, but luckily I was able to pull myself together here, and I'm just kidding. I know people hate puns, so I'm going to stay away from puns today. I don't want to single-handedly ruin your day, so I'll stay away from these. Now, if there is something that stands out to you during my speech, I would love if you would give me a hand. I would really appreciate that as well. That's, that's the last one, I promise. Besides, that's the best one that I have hand down, so I'll move on here. Ah. Oh. I had another really good one, but now I'm stumped, so I'll just keep moving on along here. <laughs> That's the last one, I promise. Now, my name is Levi Stanford, but I have a few nicknames which are a little bit easier to remember. So sometimes, I was actually in a, a show called Peter Pan. I do a lot of live theater. So naturally, sometimes I go by Tinkerbell. No, I'm just kidding. Sometimes I go by Captain Hook. <laughs> oh, my, come on now. There we go. Captain Hook. You can see why. It's called typecasting right there. Now, sometimes I also go by clock. That's a little weird, right? Why would I be called clock? It's because my hour hand is shorter than my minute hand, right? So that's how that works there. OK, that's the last one, I promise, I swear, OK? Now, today, my speech is called Resiliency is a Sword, Not a Shield. It's kind of weird, right? What the heck am I talking about, right? So resiliency is a sword, not a shield. And what I mean by that is when we face opposition, it is, there's a common misconception that goes around that resiliency means you put up a shield. That when you face all these different things that you just, oh, no, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to go through this. And we basically ignore the problem. Now, I want you guys to do something for me here. I'm going to ask you to stand. And I want you to remain standing until I say you can sit down, OK? So I want you to stand up if you have ever been bullied, and that's either by your peers, by your family, by your friends, if they have mocked you, teased you, assaulted you, pushed you around, whatever else. I want you to stand if you've ever felt bullied or picked on in your life. A lot of people, okay. Remain standing. I want you to stand if you have ever lost someone close to you or have ever felt loss in your life. Be awesome. Now, I want you to stand if you have ever felt physical pain, if you've ever sprained an ankle, ever had to get stitches, broken a bone, anything like that. All right, I want you to take a look around. You see anybody sitting down? Pretty much everybody is standing, right? So here's a question. Is facing opposition, is facing adversity, is that an if? Is it going to happen or is it a when? Does it happen to everybody? It happens to everybody. It's something that you're not going to escape. It is coming whether you like it or not. Now, I want you to sit down if you have ever felt bummed because of something you're going through. Man, this sucks. If you've ever felt bummed before, sit down. <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much everybody. I was going to ask you to sit down if you've ever felt pain. So how many of you have ever felt angry and frustrated before? So pretty much everyone. So here's the thing. When we face opposition, when we face adversity, what comes with that? Negative emotions, right? That is our body's natural response to the adversity that we're going through. Our body releases these chemicals, which then makes us angry, upset, super bummed out. Now, is that a bad thing? Is that not natural? We should try to shy away and get rid of these feelings right now. Is it a bad thing to feel sad and angry? No, it's natural. That is what our bodies do. That is our natural response. But there's this weird belief that I've heard nowadays that resiliency is putting up that shield because people think it's bad to feel angry. It's bad to feel sad. So they put that shield up. They're too afraid to face their problems. And they say, no, I'm not, I'm not angry. I'm not sad. Why is this happening to me? And they refuse to accept what is going on in their life. True resiliency, if you want to overcome opposition, if you want to overcome that true adversity, you have to to pick up the sword, put down the shield, and take action. That is what resiliency is. It's an action word. It's not a defense. It is an offense. So for me, what I believe is that there are three main keys that go into resilience. And these are what I'm going to be talking about today. Triple DT, acceptance, and focus. But before, before I get into any of this, there's always two questions that I get asked. And I know that if I don't get these questions out of the way, that you guys will probably be thinking them, and you won't even listen to a word I say. Now, I was shopping in Costco this one time, and I'm pushing my cart around, 
And I reach over, I grab a bag of chips, throw it in my cart like that. And thinking nothing of it, I keep going around. But out of the corner of my eye, I catch this guy's jaw just drop to the floor. And he's like, what the heck? Because he saw me opening and closing my hook, right? And so I get stared at everywhere I go. I get stared at so much, I have different names for the looks that I get. And this guy was doing what I call the secret agent, where someone wants to stare at me so bad, but they don't want to get caught, right? So they, they pretend that they're doing something, then they'll take a look, trying to, then trying to look away, trying to be real sneaky. And that's what this guy was doing. He's pre clearly pretending to read these labels on things that he doesn't want to buy, but he's like <coughs> looking around, going back to it. Because he wants to see what's going on. So I start really hamming it up. I start picking everything off the shelf, you know, doing my thing. And this guy is following me around the store. He's going for like five minutes straight. He's going around the aisles and saying, what's going on? And then finally he came up and said, man, I have got to know. How does that thing work, right? So this is the number one question that I get asked. So to show you how this thing works, I actually need someone who can come up here and hold my hand for me. Not this one. Like, you need to hold my arm. My man, come on up here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what's your name? What's that? Sorry, I can't hear very well. Abby. Abby? Yes. Everyone give Abby a round of applause to come up here being brave. So if you can stand on this side for me, Abby. So what I'm going to be doing, Abby, is I'm actually going to be taking off my prosthetic, and I need you to hold it for me, okay? Now, when I take this off, you're going to see an arm without a hand. It's going to look a little funky, obviously, but it's nothing to be afraid of, okay? So I'm going to take this off. Now, Abby, there's a reason why I picked you. Not just because your hand went up first, but because I said, Abby looks like a trustworthy guy. I think I can trust you, my man, because this prosthetic costs $10,000 right here. So I'm trusting you with basically a car right here. So can I trust Abby, you guys think? I, I think so, OK? So obviously, you got to be careful, OK, my man? No, 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 no. Oh, please, 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 please. Oh, my goodness. Well, the cable's broke, so. Dude, Abby, come on, man. I'm just kidding. Here you go. <laughs> this thing is made out of carbon fiber, and it's got a titanium hook. So you could run it over with a truck. It'd be fine. So I, I just had to have some fun with you, OK? So what you see here, this is commonly known as a stump or a nub, but I call it my little chicken wing, because it just kind of, it's kind of useless, right? It's flipping around. Now, the thing about this is it looks pretty useless, right? What can I do with this? But if I go to the gym, sometimes they have what's called a speed bag. And sometimes you want to try and see how fast you can hit this thing, right? And I can go pretty fast with this one, but with this one, it's like, you know, super fast. So it's good on that end. But the problem is I don't sleep with my prosthetic on, right? I sleep with my nub like this. And so if someone were to break into my house and I had to come down and try to scare them away, I'd be like, hey! You get out of my house, huh? You want to throw down right now? Let's go. Come on, right? They would laugh at me, tell me, go back to bed, and they would take my TV, right? Now, how this actually works is there's a sleeve right here, and this sleeve rolls onto my arm. And it's got a rubber backing on it that sticks to my arm, and that's what holds it on. It's kind of like a wetsuit. And then if you notice, it's got this metal bracket on the front. This is actually what slides into a little hole on my prosthetic, and that's what keeps it on. So I can take this from you here, Abby. Thanks for holding my arm for me. Now, just two seconds here. So if you listen really close, you'll hear it click into the hole. So there. Now it's not coming off. I have to push a button right here in order to release that. So I could pull on this really hard. It's not coming off. Go ahead. Pull on my hook right there, Abby. Show them that it's not coming off. Give it a good pull there. Oh, no. Dude! <laughs> Pulling my hand off, man. What the heck? No, I'm just kidding. Thank you so much for Abby coming up here. Give him a round of applause. Thank you for taking crap, man. You're, you're a good sport. So how that was able to work is I have this little metal ring right here. If I twist this all the way to the right, it allows me to swivel my hook around. And then if it's in the middle, it's locked. It's not going to move. It's not going to pull out. But if I have it all the way to the left, then I can pull it out and switch in different attachments and stuff. Now, how I'm actually able to open and close the hook, I can get this angled here, is you'll notice that there's a cable right here. So this cable actually connects to the hook, and then it runs down into a sling right here. So what I do is I throw the sling around my shoulder. It takes a little bit to adjust here. And then all I have to do is pull on this with my shoulder, and then pulls on the cable and opens that hook like this. So I'll show you from the back here. 
See how that works there? Really, really simple design. But because I've gotten really good with it, I can make it do its thing without even thinking about it, right? And so sometimes I'll tell people, you know, I just think really hard and then, whoa, look at that, right? Telekinesis. And I love having fun with it. So that's how it works. Now, the reason why this thing costs 10 freaking thousand dollars is a lot of it has to do with the attachments. This right here is $1,500. And I said, forget that. If I want a new hand, I don't want to have to pay that much. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to make my own. So I started making my own attachments, and I brought a few for you guys today to see kind of what I got going on. Now, I love cooking. And one of my favorite things to do is going on the barbecue. I'm a big grill kind of person. So naturally, I had to make myself something for flipping those birds, right? That way I get a perfect, nice, good flip right there. I was actually out with my family one time. We were at this park uh, having a little picnic. And I was just kind of sitting there working the grill, flipping my burgers, and I slowly see this car driving by. And all the guys are just, their face right up against the window trying to see what's going on here, right? So to break the ice, I just looked at them and I was like, oh, hey, how's it going? And they're like, what? And they kind of took off speeding. So this is one that I use probably the most. Now, as you can tell by my Captain American bod that I got going on here, I, can, I like to work out, right? Now I do. And one of the workouts I love doing is push-ups. But it's really hard to do push-ups with a hook, right? Because then it slips and I fall on my face and it's a bit of a nightmare, right? So I was trying to figure out what can I do to make it easier for me to do push-ups. Well, I was walking outside one day and I see this guy and he has this cane. And it's got these feet coming off the bottom and it's really stable. And I'm like, that's what I need right there. So I went up and I was like, thank you, my good sir. Took that thing. No, I'm just kidding. I went out, I bought a cane, chopped the bottom off, welded the bolt on there. So I throw this in there. And this is how I'm able to do push-ups. So I'll kind of show you how this thing works. So it acts as a base. So that way I'm not going to fall on my face, right? <laughs> uh, you know. So that's how that thing works. <laughs> okay. Whew. I haven't done push-ups for a while, as you can see. My face is about to explode. All right. So there we go. Now, my brother likes to make attachments for me. And so I wake up and he gives me this call Christmas morning. He says, Levi, I made this attachment for you, but you got to come outside to see it. And I'm like, go outside? Sweet. He got me a shotgun or something, right? <laughs> Super excited. But he's like, man, I remember that when you were a kid, you loved Indiana Jones. How many of you guys are fans of Indiana Jones? And I'm not talking Crystal Skull. That stuff is garbage. I'm talking the good ones, OK? I was a huge fan. Now, Indiana Jones always has something with him. What is he known for? His whip. So my brother comes out and he says, man, I made you a bull whip, OK? <clears throat> so I'm going to go very, very, very far away. <laughs> so this is the bull whip. <clears throat> so now all I have to do is throw this in here, make sure I'm in the middle so you guys aren't going to be taken out. But it's all right, because you signed waivers, right? So you're good? Yeah, OK. Just kidding. So all I have to do now is flip this around. Like that. So that is my bull whip. <laughs> now, do you think the cops would be happy if they saw some guy walking around town with a bull whip for a hand? Probably not, right? So I only really use this for fun if I want to go outside, whip some cans or something like that. But I don't walk around with it, obviously, right? Now, I love camping. How many of you have ever gone camping before and enjoy it? All right, most of you. Now, what's one of the biggest things you got to do when you go camping? You got to build a what? A fire, right? What do we do with fires? We love to cook stuff on them. What are some good things that you like to cook on the fire? Hot dogs. What else? I heard something else. Marshmallows, right? Got to make those perfect s'mores. Now, when I'm camping or I'm with friends and I'm roasting hot dogs or marshmallows, what usually happens? You're sitting there and the fire's pretty hot, right? So your hand gets hot, so you're like, ugh, you sit there like this. Well, meanwhile, my friends would look over at me and I have the roaster in my hook, so I'm just sitting there, not hurting me any. And so eventually everyone said, hey, can you roast my hot dog for me? Can you roast my marshmallow? And I'm like, you know what? If this is going to be a thing, I might as well make an attachment for it, right? So, Got my hot dog roasting stick here. It is extendable. Okay. <clears throat> now, the perfect way to cook a marshmallow is it's got to be even on all sides, right? 
So if it's just on one side, it's useless. So I made it rotisserie so I can sit there and I could spin that bad boy, get the perfect hot dog and the perfect mellow every time, right? So that is my hot dog roasting attachment. It's also my self-defense one if I need to, right? No, I'm just kidding. There you go. Now, this is one that I actually bought. So let's pull this out here. I bought this for 1500 bucks. I used to call this my fancy hand. I usually would wear it to church or something, just if I didn't want to wear the hook. And I would wear a long sleeve shirt that would cover up my prosthetic. So all there would be is this hand. So it looked relatively real until my dog got a hold of it and chewed all my fingertips off on the thing there. So now this is just a really expensive chew toy. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We're, that's the last one, we're done. Now, the thing about this thing is I was actually shopping this one time. It's always when I'm shopping that awkward things happen. And I was in the grocery store, and I had that long sleeve shirt on covering all of this up. And I get all my groceries in the bags. I put them in this hand, and then I came down. And I forgot that it was twisted all the way to the left. So the weight of the groceries popped this hand out of the socket, and it was hanging there like that with all my grocery bags in there. Now, I wouldn't have thought anything of it, except I hear this scream. And this poor little girl, I turn around, and she's holding her mom's leg, and she's like, Mom, his hand fell off, and was freaking out. Meanwhile, I'm over there just trying to shove this back in here, like, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to go shopping, and I'm scarring people for life, right? So those are just a few attachments that I have. Um, I have a whole kitchen set, actually, with all the whisks and everything. I have a fly swatter attachment. A uh, ton of different attachments. So those are just a few that I brought today. So that is the number one question that I get asked, is how does this thing work? So now you guys know. Next time you see an amputee, you don't have to be staring at them, because now you know, right? So the second question I get asked is what happened? How did I become a pirate in the first place, right? Well, it all started when my wife and I, we got married. And on our honeymoon, we were flying over to Southeast Asia, to Thailand for our honeymoon. And there's a huge problem that I didn't realize. And that's what motivated me to be a speaker, was to raise awareness about this problem. Because when you're in a plane up that high in the atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure is really low. So they have to pressurize the cabin of the plane so that it's more equal to what we're used to down here. Well, the problem then is everything is now pressurized in the plane. So thinking nothing of it, I'm using the bathroom. And I dropped my wedding, wing, wedding, ring, wedding pff, ring in the toilet. And just like Sarah was saying, you have that 0.5 seconds, that five seconds to make a decision. And mine was, I'm going to get this ring back, thinking nothing of it. I reach into that toilet. Sorry. And I accidentally hit the flush. And the next thing I know, because everything was pressurized, it sucked my hand right off. And I flushed it. Why are you laughing? I'm just kidding. Come on. <laughs> I had to have some fun. That is impossible, OK? You cannot flush your hand down the toilet, I, I promise. So that is not what happened. I got to have a little bit of fun with you guys, right? So don't worry. Next time you're on a plane, the toilet's not going to take any appendages off. I promise. You guys are good. No, the number, the actual, the actual reason, the actual story, how many of you love fireworks? Oh, there's always a groan because you know what's coming, right? I love fireworks. My whole life, I was obsessed with them. So much that I would make my own fireworks, and it was because the science behind it. I wasn't some crazy person that just wanted to blow stuff up. I loved that you could mix these chemicals together, and then they could create this powerful reaction. I loved it. And so much that I actually wanted to become a demolitionist. I freaking loved it. Now, I was working on this waterproof explosive, and what would happen, we'd have two and a half pounds worth of this explosive in a waterproof container. I would lower it into the water, and then I would have electric cables going in there to a blast cap. So that way, I could lower it into the water, back up with the cables, touch it to a battery, and then when it went off, it would shoot this huge geyser of water into the air. And I thought this would be so cool. But some priorities took over place. I was planning for a wedding at the time. So my wife and I, we got married. And we got married on a Friday. So the following Wednesday, just five days after, my family was having this huge get-together. And it was my nephew's adoption party, he just got adopted, and then also my parents' anniversary and my niece's birthday. So this is a pretty big day. 
And we're all kind of celebrating with some family, and a lot of my family came up from the United States to be there. Now, just outside of the town that I live in, in Cartston, just down south, uh, southern Alberta, we have these abandoned train bridges that sit on the edge of a reservoir. So you can actually jump off these bridges into the reservoir. It's a really fun swimming spot. So my brother says, well, why don't we gather up some of the family who have never been there and go bridge jumping? And I'm like, this is a great idea. And then, ding, this little light bulb goes off and it says, hey, remember that waterproof explosive you were working on? This is a perfect time to show it off and impress your family with this really cool pyrotechnic display. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this. But there was a problem. The stores that were, had all the electric cables that I needed to have a safe demolition were closed. So I'm like, ah, I really want to do this. And I was impatient. And I said, you know what? If I get a really long burn fuse that has about two minutes worth of burn time, I could light the fuse, throw it in my waterproof container, and screw on the lid, throw it in the water plenty of time, right? And what had happened was I was so complacent, I was so comfortable with these explosives that I became impatient and I said, this is what is happening. And I put all my focus on just doing it. And because of that, because of that complacency, I didn't realize that there were problems. Like, hello, a two foot fuse in a small container probably has a better chance of lighting itself off early, right? And from the outside, it's like, yamaran. But for me, I was so comfortable and complacent, that's what I was gonna do. So my family, we go out to this bridge my family, they're all standing right here. I walk across this bridge, jump down the embankment, get across this tree, and over to right where the picture was taken. And I'm like, all right. And I start getting this explosive ready. I bend down like this. I get everything in my container, get the blast cap ready, and then I tell my brother, all right, hit record. We want to get this on camera. Because I used to make these YouTube videos of kind of blowing stuff up, right? So he hits record. I light my fuse. I screw on the lid. Everything's going pretty good. And just as I pull my right hand away, boom, it goes off. Two and a half pounds worth of this explosive just went off right by my face. Now I want you to look at this picture. This is the last picture of me with both of my hands. This was taken from that video that my brother got. Right after this is where the blast goes off. Now this is where the explosive is. It's right down here, I'm over top of it. So keep a look at that. Now I want you to take a look at this. This is from one of those videos I used to put on YouTube of me blowing stuff up. This was like my Merry Christmas, everyone. This was a snowman, and this is after that explosive. Which direction is that blast going? Up and out, like that, right? This is a washing machine that we blew up. Which direction is that blast going? Up and out, like this, right? It was actually so powerful that the top of that washing machine went over 100 feet into the air. This is really powerful stuff, right? So looking at this, if that explosive is right underneath my face, what should have happened? It should have taken off my head. I should not be here talking to you today. This is what should have happened. But you guys are about to witness a miracle. There's a reason why I'm standing here today. And it's something that I can't explain. So the next slide that I'm going to show you is of the blast. Now you don't physically see me getting blown up, otherwise I wouldn't show it. You see the blast itself. Now, even though you don't see me physically being blown up, the nature of the photo can still be pretty disturbing. So if you don't want to look at it, please don't try to you know, push through. Just don't look at it, okay? But you guys are going to look at a miracle. Which way is that blast going? Sideways. It's going out to the sides. And then this part right here was into the ground. It's like someone took a force field and put it in front of me, and it pushed the blast out and away from me. This is the direction that it went. Now, it doesn't matter what you believe in, whether you think I'm just the luckiest guy on earth, or whether you believe in a higher power, whatever it may be, you can't deny that this is a miracle. I should not be here talking to you today. But for some reason, the blast got pushed out and away from me, and I only caught a little bit of it. Now, the blast goes off. This is the crater that it left in the ground. It was over a foot deep and three feet wide, a huge crater. And I was kneeling right on the edge, right here. This is in that picture, that huge ground getting scooped out. That's what it was from. I should have had that impact right in my face, and I didn't. Now, the blast goes off, and I remember thinking, I'm dead. I have to be dead. There's no way I'm alive right now. The force of the blast was so strong, it fractured my orbital bones right here. And it didn't knock me out. That was a miracle on its own. 
Because I'm thinking to myself, oh, I have to be dead. I have to be dead. And all I hear is this screaming. Because from my family's angle, all they saw was a cloud of smoke. They didn't know what was left on the other side. And so I'm sitting there thinking, I don't feel any pain right now. I mean, I felt like I just got hit by a truck. But I'm no pain. I have to be dead. And then all of a sudden, this huge rush of pain came in. And I realized, I'm alive. I'm alive. And I start looking around. I can only see out of this eye because I had so much shrapnel in my face. And I look over and my hand is gone. There's nothing left. And I'm looking at this thinking, I am a musician. How am I going to be a musician? How am I going to play guitar? How am I going to hold my son? How am I going to do all these things? And my life was just flashing in my mind. My hand is gone. And I'm like, if I don't get out of here, I am going to die. And so I try to stand up and I get up and I look down and my body is shredded. The force of the blast was so strong, it actually took my clothes off and fractured my facial bones. That's how powerful it was. And I just got hit with a little bit of it. Could you imagine if I had taken that full force of the blast? I wouldn't be here. Now, my brother, he runs down there. He's assessing me. He says, all right, we need to get you out of here. So my family decides that they are going to try to carry me across all these mud flats here, over this tree, up this thing, across this freaking death trap of a bridge to my truck to get me to the ambulance. Now my wife, she starts walking over there. She's having a panic attack. And my sister stops her and says, Amy, don't go over there. You don't want to see Levi right now, okay? Just, just stay here. We'll take care of it. Now this is how amazing my wife is. Remember Sarah saying you have that 0.5 seconds to decide? My wife was sitting there shaking and she had this feeling come over and it said, what are you doing, Amy? Your husband needs you. Take in a deep breath and go and help. And so she decided, and then my sister, she's behind me. She has her arms underneath mine, and she's kind of wrapped around my torso. Now, because of how much blood was on me and the fact that I weighed 230 pounds at that point, it was really hard to hold me. So they would lift me, put me down. Lift me, put me down. And they did that all the way across here. They got me over this tree, and they got me about halfway up this embankment here. And my sister... She has her arms around me. She stands up to try and get up the bank, and she slipped and fell, and she just burst into tears. She says, Levi, I can't. I have no more strength left in me. I can't do this. I am so sorry. Please, please forgive me. And as soon as she said that, I had this impression that said, stand up. And I said, I'm going to try to stand. And so my family, my sister, she puts her hand on my back, and with all her might, pushes me and I stand up and I get up on top of the bank I crawled up that bank as though nothing was wrong with me another miracle now I'm standing right here at the edge of the bridge looking at all of this going there's not a freaking chance there's trusses that are missing there's nails all over this thing this is a death trap on its own I'm thinking while well, the explosion didn't kill me but this certainly is right here but I'm sitting there I, my vision is almost gone I have so much blood in my eyes that I can barely see but I knew that if I didn't get across that bridge, I was going to die. So I put my arms around my sisters and I just started walking, hoping and praying that I wouldn't trip and fall to my death. And another miracle happened. My family said that I walked across that bridge as though nothing was wrong with me. Every step I took was exactly where it needed to be. Now I get to that huge gap you see at the bottom right there. And my brother, I'm standing there thinking, there's no way I'm going to get over this. So my brother starts backing up the truck. And he had the tailgate down. So the tailgate was going to cover up this gap. That way I could just roll into the box of the truck. Now I'm standing there waiting for him. And because of everyone's adrenaline is just flying, he uh, may or may not have hit me with the tailgate. <laughs> Add a little insult to injury, right? So I'm sitting there. He bumps me with the tailgate. I roll into the box of the truck. My wife jumps in there with me. And then my family, they all pile into the cab and they take off. They're trying to get me to the ambulance. Now, this is in the middle of nowhere on a dirt road. So I'm in the box of this truck with a missing a hand in the condition I'm in, and I'm just getting tossed around like this. And I'm like, I survived a blast. I survived this bridge. Now my brother's driving is going to freaking kill me, right? I was panicking. And I started asking my wife, Amy, do I still have a face? Is my face still there? I thought this whole side of my face was gone. She said, yes, Levi, you still have your face. Now, I'm not going to repeat what I said next, but I basically said, Amy, are we still going to be able to have kids? She said, yes, Levi, you're good. And then I had to do the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. To this day, this was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I said, Amy, I want you to know you have my blessing to be remarried. 
I don't want you going the rest of your life not knowing if I would be okay with it. I was essentially saying goodbye. Looking at the condition I was in, I was not, things weren't looking good. And this is how strong my wife is. In that moment, she lifts up her hand and she backhands me on the face and says, shut your mouth. No, I'm just kidding. She said, Levi, what are you talking about? You have so much more to do in this life. You're not going anywhere. You have so many lives that you are going to impact. You are not going anywhere. She was such a huge strength for me in that moment. Now, they get me to the Carson Hospital, and they're trying to get me stable so that they can fly me up to the Foothills Hospital. And I, the last thing that I remember was my dad. And he was giving, in, in my religion, what we call a priesthood blessing. And it's basically a prayer on your behalf. And my dad is praying. He's saying, Levi, God wants you to know that this is just going to be a trial in your life and that you will make a recovery. And as soon as he said that, all my pain left. And you've probably heard of these near-death experiences and things like that. And that is exactly what I was going through. So I'm thinking, this is it. I'm dying. This is it for me. My life is ceasing to exist. And I thought about it. And I'm like, I don't want to go back to a life without a hand in the condition that I was in. So I embraced it. I let myself go to it. And I said, all right, this is how things are going to be. And I let myself go. And in that moment, when I thought my life was over, I felt this huge peace just embrace me. And it said, everything is going to be okay. And I was just enveloped in this love and this peace. But then I started thinking. I started thinking of a wife of just five days having to mourn her husband. I started thinking of a family, my friends, having to mourn their loved one. And I said, no, I'm not ready to die. And I started pleading. And I said, please, just please give me 10 minutes, just 10 minutes to go back and say my goodbyes to everyone. That's all I want. And my heart was burning. Please, let me live. And then I hear this voice calling out. And it's kind of fuzzy, but it gets clearer. And I recognize the voice as my wife. And she's calling out. She's saying, Levi, you're waking up. You're waking up. You're doing so good. I'm like, what? And I open up my right eye, and I see the most beautiful woman staring back at me. And my wife is saying, you're alive. You've woken up. You did so good. And I had this breathing tube shoved down my throat, so I couldn't do anything. But I wanted to say, I'm alive. I wanted to yell it from the top of the roof. I was so, so happy. So immense joy that I got my second chance at life. Now, for me, that moment felt like 45 seconds, the whole I'm passing on. But I was actually sedated for an entire week. So for that week when I was in an induced coma, it actually felt like 45 seconds to me. So the next slide that I'm going to show you is of me two days after the accident. Now, I tried to choose the least graphic photos that I could because, obviously, I don't, I'm not here to shock you. I want to show you how far I have come from my accident. Now, if you don't handle gory things, please look away. Don't try to be the, you know, I'm going to just watch it anyways, because if you pass out, you don't want me to catch you. I mean, it's, that's, that's what you have to land into, right? So this was me two days after. This is why I thought I had lost half my face, because I had so much shrapnel get blasted into my face. I still can't see out of my left eye very well anymore. And then this was my full body. So I was being kept alive with all these tubes, all these different machines. And then I finally woke up. This is the day that I woke up. And this was me trying to attempt to smile. I was so, so happy. And even though I got my second chance at life, it wasn't going to be easy. I'm missing my left hand, which is the main chord hand for guitar. And also, I could not move this hand. You can't, can kind of see, but this is all skin graft right here. And I could not move this hand. I had to work really hard to get this mobility back. So my life was facing all these obstacles. But I got through it, and I'm here talking to you guys today. And how I was able to get here was through these next principles that I'm going to teach you, okay? So if you remember, the first key to resiliency is triple DT. What do you guys think triple DT stands for? Don't do dumb things, okay? <laughs> the best way to avoid an accident like mine is to just make smart choices. Like this guy. Don't be dumb like this guy, okay? Make some better decisions than this, okay? Now think about this. This picture was taken right after I had just gone off a really big uh, mountain bike jump. I love mountain biking. Now I had gone off this jump. This was bigger than anything I had done before, but I thought, I'm going to do this. So looking at this, do you think I made the jump? Here I am celebrating, right? You guys think I made the jump or did I crash really hard? 
I made it. Uh, let's, let's take a look here. Let's see how it goes. Oh, come on. I know the suspense is killing me. Come on. There we go. All right. Oh, <laughs> gee, no. <laughs> As you can see, things did not go well for me, right? Now, here's the thing about dumb decisions is they are completely subjective, which means that they are based on opinion depending on our experiences, right? For me, I was an experienced mountain biker, and so when my wife was saying, hey, you probably shouldn't do that jump, I thought, no, I'm experienced, I can do this, no problem, and I went for it, and I almost broke my wrist. And the same thing goes with the explosives. I get so many people that say, Levi, what were you doing playing with explosives, you moron? Are you serious? Why, why would you make that choice? Because for me, I had been doing it my whole life. It was something I was comfortable with. Show of hands, how many of you have ever ridden a bike or a scooter without a helmet before? Pretty much everyone, right? How many of you have ever texted and driven before? I have, right? How many of your parents have ever texted and driven before? A lot of us, right? The thing is, is we make these decisions on a daily basis that if something was to go wrong could result in serious injury or death. But the problem is we decide that since we have experience doing it, that we don't need to worry about it. And that's the problem. As soon as you think this isn't going to happen to me, that's when things go wrong. And for 95% of you, you are going to make that decision to do it, and nothing's going to happen. You are going to get lucky. But for 5% of you, something's going to go wrong, and then you have to be stuck in a situation where you think, what if? What if I would have just worn my helmet? What if I would have put my phone down? What if I would have waited? until the store with the proper ignition cables were open. And then I got this. And at that, living with that what if, is a personal hell that is very, very hard to get over. Because this was me, my fault. And it is so hard to get over that. And so please, make smart decisions. Actually, no, I want you guys to promise me something. Take your hand, put it over your heart like this, okay? I want you to repeat after me. The next time I am faced with the decision, the next time I'm faced with decision that I don't feel is uh, quite smart, <laughs> and people are saying, hey, you probably shouldn't do that, I am going to be humble, I'm going to be humble. and I'm going to take five seconds and ask, <laughs> is what I'm getting out of this worth it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> That's what you have to ask yourself. Is what I'm getting out of this actually worth the risk? And if it's not, then don't do it. Don't give in to peer pressure or whatever else because it is not worth it. Listen to yourself. And if you decide, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do it, you have to be willing to accept the circumstances, which leads us into key number two. The second key is acceptance. Accepting responsibility. Is everything that happen into, happens in your life, is that your fault? If you get born into a family, a very abusive family with parents who are very abusive, is that your fault? No. If you're walking down the street, somebody mugs you, beats you up, is that your fault? Absolutely not. Now, like I said, if you remember back when you guys were standing up, every single one of us faced adversity. And it is natural to put up that shield because those negative feelings come and we say, I don't want to go through this. And we're afraid to face our challenges. But you have to learn to accept responsibility. And what that means is, you know what, it may not be your fault that you're in that position, but it is 100% your responsibility to say, I'm not going to think, why me? But what now? It is 100% your responsibility to put down your sword or put down your shield pick up that sword and take action. Nobody is going to do that for you. Nobody was going to say, all right, Levi, we're going to get you out of the hospital bed and moving again. That was completely my decision. That weight rests on your shoulders. And until you accept that, until you say, this problem is not going anywhere, I have to choose to get over it, you are going to stay stuck in a victim mentality holding up that shield saying, no, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's. You're the reason why I'm angry. You're the reason why I'm not successful. You're the reason why I'm sad. It is your responsibility. 
Now, when you take that responsibility, when you decide, okay, I'm going to start to move on, the third key is how you do it, and it is focus. So what do you guys think you should be focusing on? What do you think? Good grades. Good grades. Hey, that's very, very important, right? Focusing on something. This is going to blow your guy's mind. Okay, are you ready? This is going to change your life today. Are you guys ready for this? Are you ready to have your lives changed today or what? This is going to be awesome. All right, you guys ready? Give me a drum roll for me. This is huge. Drum those feet. All right, focus on the positive. <laughs> There's always a groan, right? Now, I get it. This is very important, but it's been said so much that it's become cliche, right? So I want to change it for you guys today. I want you to focus on what you can control, okay? Now, I woke up, I was super happy. Yes, I'm alive, right? And I was super stoked, but my family had left, and I was left alone in the ICU all by myself at night. Now, I had a brother-in-law who broke his back, and the doctors gave him a very powerful pain medication called Oxycontin. And they kept giving it to him to eventually he got hooked on it, and then he overdosed and died. So because of that, I was afraid to take pain medication. I didn't understand that if you're in pain, your body needs it. It's not until you start abusing it that you can become addicted. So the nurses would come into my room and be like, Levi, what's your pain level at? And I'm like, it's a three. You're fine. You're good, right? I'm sitting there missing a hand, you know, all this stuff. But it was like 15. And so I'm just sitting there in so much pain. And that's when the negativity started creeping in. And I started thinking, Levi, you moron. You idiot. Look what you did to yourself. Are you happy? You wanted to have a little explosion. Now you're missing your hand. You can barely move. You are a moron. And I did this for about four hours. I just broke down, beating myself up, saying, why? Why me? Why did this have to happen? And then this feeling came over me. And it said, Levi, you don't have a left hand. But you have a right hand. You may be having a hard time seeing and hearing, but guess what? You can see and hear. You may be having a hard time breathing, but guess what? You're breathing. You're alive when you should be dead. What are you complaining about? See, the problem was up until that point, I was focusing on all the things I could not control. If I sprinkle some water on this and set it out in the sun and I'm growing a hand back anytime soon, I'm not Deadpool. I'm not going to get a little tiny hand sprouting out of this thing, right? It's impossible. But that's where my focus was. And it wasn't until I shifted my focus on all the things that were good in my life that I decided, all right, I'm going to accept my responsibility and start to move on. When I finally was able to shift my focus over, I decided to pick up that sword and take action. And here's the thing, you remember, every single one of us goes through adversity. Every single one of us experiences sadness, anger, fear. It is always going to be a part of us, just like this will always be a part of me. But at the same time, there's always something good that you can latch on to. There's always your friends and your family, somebody there to support you. And de determining where you find out and where you end up in life matters on where you shift your focus. Are you going to stay focused on the things you can't control, the negative, the problem, or are you going to focus on the solution, the positive, the things you can control? And that is so important. Now, to kind of demonstrate this, I need two people to come up here and give me a hand. Anybody? I just, I'm not going to be doing anything to you, I promise. I just need you to hold a tape measure, okay? My man, come on up here. And then, yes, you in the gray. Come on up, my friend. <clears throat> so I'm going to get you to take, I can get this out here. There, so I'm going to get you to take that in. No, don't do anything yet. And I need you to take this in. What's your name, my friend? Aiden. Aiden? Yes. So this is Aiden, everybody, and what's your name? Clayton. Clayton. So Aiden and Clayton, give him a round of applause for coming up here being brave. So we have some measurements on this tape measure. Every 12 inches, every foot, I want it to represent 10 years of your life, okay? So take this here, Aiden, now I want you to go back. Keep going back a little bit. So there you go, 20 years, 30 years. I want you to go all the way to 10 feet, okay? Right, right there. Okay, because I told you guys not to do dumb things, you're gonna get, make smart decisions, right? So that way you're gonna live to be 100, okay? Average life expectancy is about 86, but you guys are smart, so 100, here we go, okay? Now, or even there you go, <laughs> just keep going out. Now you guys are sitting about right here. This is where we are in our life, right? 16, 17, 18 year olds, 15, whatever. This is about where you guys are. 
Now here's the problem, is when we go through adversity, it's like stubbing our toe. How many of you have ever stubbed your toe before? Pretty much everyone, right? When you stub your toe, what are you focusing on? That freaking toe, it's hurting really bad, right? And that's where all our focus goes, is on the negative. When really we have an entire body that is totally fine. We have so much stuff to be focused on what's in our control. And here's the thing is when we go through adversity, it's like stubbing our toe. All we do is focus on this one little spot, this one little moment in our life, right? When we have all of this life to live. Now, how many of you have ever heard someone say, you just got to hold out till tomorrow. Tomorrow will be better. How many of you have ever heard someone say, you just got to hold out till next month. You just got to graduate and then all of this will be better. I'm going to drop a truth bomb on you guys today that you're not going to like. You're not going to appreciate this, okay? But this is the truth. Tomorrow's not going to get better. Next month, it's not going to get better. Just because you graduate high school doesn't mean life is going to be better. Now you're probably thinking, what the heck? I thought you were an inspirational speaker. You suck, man. Listen up and listen close. Tomorrow can be better, but you have to make a choice to change today. If you want that month to get better, you have to choose for yourself that you're going to put down your shield, pick up that sword, and take action today. And that is entirely your responsibility. And I know that is terrifying. That is scary because when we're going through this, we want someone to take our pain away. But it's not going to happen. But if there's one thing, one thing that I want you to remember from today, from my speech, it's this, okay? Listen up. It's that you are so much stronger than you think you are. If someone would have asked Levi, could you imagine losing your hand? How would you deal with that? I would have said, forget that. There's no way I could handle something like that. Are you kidding me, losing my hand? And then guess what? It happened. And not only did I handle it, but I was able to put my shield down and I overcame. And the only way I was able to do that is if I accepted responsibility and if I shifted my focus onto what I could control. And now I get to live the rest of my life without the weight of this on my shoulders. So please do not give up in this little moment right here the possibility of living out this awesome, wonderful life. Don't let that fear take over and make you decide, no, I'm going to keep my shield here. I'm going to be a victim and blame everybody else. Because then you ruin that chance. You have that five seconds to decide, am I going to move on or not, right? Take it so you get all of that. Thank you so much, man. I'll let yeah. this go here. I guide this in here pretty easy. There you go. Thank you, sir. Now, I quickly, if I can here. So let's all go over this again. The first key is what? Triple DT? Okay, I think someone over here got it. What does this mean? One more time for me here. Awesome. All right, the second one. Someone got it. Thank you, my man. I appreciate that. What is number two? Acceptance. What is number two? Acceptance. Thank you. And then three. Focus on what? Someone is jumping the gun. I love it. Enthusiasm. Focus on what? You can control. Guys, come on. All right. This time when you do it, I want to see some dust coming down from the ceiling here. I want this place shaking. I want cars driving by thinking, oh my gosh, Chesmere is having an earthquake right now, all right? Let's do this. On the count of three, focus on what you can control. Here we go. One, two, three. Focus on what you can control. One more time. Here we go. Focus on what you can control. Thank you. I love it. Now, I want to finish with a song for you guys today. This is off my debut album that I just put out <clears throat> last year. Okay. It is. <clears throat> so this song <clears throat> is called This Is My Life. <clears throat> now in order to do it, I need you guys' help, okay? <clears throat> so how the chorus goes, I need you guys to say ooh-ah with me, okay? So one, two, three. Ooh-ah. Ooh okay? Not so bad, not so bad. Try them again. Ooh-ah. Ooh-ah. Ooh All right. Try it really low. Ooh-ah. 
Right on. All right, let's go as high as we can. Ooh ah! Okay, let's let's not do that again. Never mind. I'm sorry about that. I'm kidding. Now I want to get some friendly competition going on here. You guys are a smaller group, but I think if you guys actually believe, you might be able to do this. Okay? I want you guys, everyone over here, give me an ooh ah. Ooh ah! Not so bad. All right, you guys, what do you got for me? Ooh ah! Ooh, you guys are gonna have to try a little bit harder. One more time. Ooh ah! All right, one more time. That's pretty close, you guys. They got less than you, and they still are pretty loud. So I'm going to need a little bit more. So this is how it's going to go. The chorus goes like this. Nobody's going to tell me how to live today. I'm singing. And now what I'm going to do is if I point over here, you guys will go, ooh-ah. And if I point over here, you will go, ooh-ah. And if I go like this, I want both of you to say it, OK? So it'll go like this. Nobody's going to tell me how to live today. I'm singing. This is my life, I'm going to live in the moment, not in yesterday, singing. This is my life, so come on, everybody, it's time to see. We only got one life, why not live it free? I'm being true to myself, no matter what they say, singing. This is my life. All right, you guys ready for this? <clears throat> All right, should be good to go. <clears throat> ah! Hello, hello? <laughs> testing, testing. Woo! That's pretty loud. Here, I'll hold it down. There we go. <clears throat> All right. Is it working? So it's really quiet at the beginning. There we go. So my wife is going to be at the back. And she goes up. Music louder. All right, everybody. I want to see your hands up for me here. I want you guys to show me that you actually believe that you can overcome your stuff. I want you to actually understand that this is your life and only one person is gonna fix it for you and that's you, all right? Get those hands up, here we go. Follow me, let's go. 